Okay, so we're going to talk about artificial selection, how humans can change nature through selective breeding, and what the limits are to that. What you're seeing right here is not a cow on steroids. It is called the Belgian Blue, which is a uh, breed of cow that essentially has been selected for by humans to produce more muscle, more meat, because more meat, more beef. Now, again, nature made this. This is a random variation that just happened. It's called a double-muscled cow, but that random variation we've selected for because we like the extra beef. Now, perhaps you've heard of the horse named Secretariat. Secretariat was a fantastic racehorse, uh, considered to be one of the best of all time. Now, I don't know if you're aware, but most horse races don't end with huge uh, lead between first and second. Most of them end, you know, like half a length here or a quarter of a length here. Not Secretariat. Secretariat's 1973 Belmont Stakes win is considered one of the most dominating performances in sports history. It wasn't even close. He won by about an eighth of a mile. It was just a ridiculous thing. Now, that was 1973. Secretariat retired shortly thereafter. So the question is, what did he do between 1973 and 1989, an additional 16 years? Racehorses are not cheap to keep. Why keep around someone like Secretariat? That's because Secretariat's retirement was a little bit of this and that and that and that. Secretariat was put out to stud and was charging huge stud fees for any owner who wanted their horse to breed with him. The idea was, he's a fast horse, his babies will make fast horses. That's the idea behind artificial selection. Let's switch gears and talk about a vegetable. This is called Queen Anne's Lace. You'll probably see it in the ditches along roadsides or along any other roads, even up here. Uh, now, there's an actual vegetable in there. If you're actually able to pull out Queen Anne's Lace and look at it underneath, what you're going to see is a single taproot. That is Daucus carota, also known as carrots. This is a wild carrot that we have artificially selected and bred for to make our modern-day carrots. These are all the different varieties of carrots. And the way you make, let's say, this short stubby one right here, each generation you're going to take the carrot that has the shortest and the stubbiest, and you're going to breed them together. All the rest you're going to ignore. You're just going to focus on the traits that you want and only breed those. And then of their babies, take the ones that are shortest and fattest. And of their babies, take the ones that are shortest and fattest and breed them together. Over time, you're selecting and you get this wide variety of colors, wide variety of sizes and shapes. How do you get a dark carrot? Well, in each generation, you take the two darkest, breed them together, take their offspring, the two darkest, breed them, and so on and so forth. Or how do you get a white-colored white carrot? Take the two lightest colored ones, breed them together, and then take their babies, the two lightest ones. You get the idea there. All from this original ancestor. Humans have made these from that. And that's what artificial selection is. Nature gives us variations, and humans select those that they find useful. And nature gives those variations through mutation, through recombination, crossing over in meiosis, and of course, sexual recombination, the fact that uh, the product of two parents. So, artificial selection is the intentional breeding for certain traits, like size, or speed, or color, or appearance, in wild organisms. Humans decide the traits that they want. And we select or breed for those, and you ignore the rest, and you allow those other traits to wither away. You're only focusing on what you want. This bird here, perhaps you've seen it. These are some pretty crazy wild varieties of it, but you have seen this bird before. Every single one of these variations, these differences, is based on an original ancestor, the common pigeon. All of these birds that you've seen here were bred for it. Let's take this one for it with the long neck. How do you get a bird with a long neck? Well, each generation, you take the longest necks, you breed them together, and then you take their babies, and you take the ones with the longest necks, and you breed them together, and you ignore the rest or kill them. Functionally, it's the same as long as they don't breed, but each generation, you pick what you want, or even the one with this crap around its eyes. I don't know why you'd want it, but that's how you do it. All starting from the common pigeon. This plant here, Brassica oleracea, is a plant that you're probably familiar with. Maybe you've heard of kohlrabi, or cauliflower, or cabbage, or broccoli, or kale, or kylon, or brussels sprouts there. All of these different vegetables here are the exact same species, Brassica oleracea. Humans have made all of these different ones here, including this, it's one of my favorites, tree cabbage, by breeding together and artificially selecting the wild mustard plant for traits that we want. If you want cauliflower, you make the flower sterile. I don't know what a lateral Mary stem is, but if you enhance it, you get kohlrabi. If you enlarge the leaves, you get kale. If you keep the leaves as close together, you get cabbage. If you prevent flowers from developing, you get broccoli. All of them we've artificially selected for. This here is an entire field made out of the exact same species, Brassica oleracea.
all into these. Even cauliflower, there's orange and purple and green and obviously the white cauliflower, but these are natural variations that humans selected for over time. A natural mutation, we kept breeding together those that had what we wanted. This right here is the wild banana. You're probably familiar with the regular banana. These are different because we've artificially selected for what? Fewer seeds. You've never eaten a banana seed, or you probably never have, because we have artificially selected to remove them. This here is wild corn, also known as teosinte. We have been selecting for larger and larger corn cobs, more and more seeds, turning this as the natural, original product into this, this ridiculous corn cob. Here's teosinte, what it started as. Here's modern corn, what we've turned it into through artificial selection and breeding. This here, this thing that is smaller than the size of a penny, is a wild tomato. Yep, they started out small. We started by breeding them for larger and larger and only breeding together the largest and not breeding together anything that's too small. This is wild celery that we've bred into our modern day celery. All of these varieties of tomatoes, all of these were made possible by artificial selection of a naturally occurring thing that we just took the ones that were closest toward what we wanted and bred them. Our chickens were bred from jungle fowl. We artificially selected those. Pigs were artificially selected from wild boars. Even our cows were artificially selected from a wild ancestor. These two chickens here are both eight weeks old, but they're vastly different in weight because we've been selecting for and only breeding together the chickens that grow the largest, the fastest, because we want the meat. No drugs, no chemicals, just artificial selection made things this large. We only bred together the ones that we wanted. So right now, on your paper, think of a food item from your refrigerator, anything in there, I guarantee, I guarantee what it came from was artificially selected in some form or another. So what do you think it was artificially selected for? Now, this has happened over time quite a bit. This is the gray wolf Canis lupus. This is a modern day wolf, but we're talking from an ancestral wolf. We have bred these adorable little puffballs known as Pomeranians or Siberian Huskies, which are very similar, or Chihuahuas, which you get by breeding together only the smallest dogs, or you get something like a French Poodle or something like the Irish Wolfhound, which they use for hunting bears by only breeding together the largest ones. You can even breed for behavior and get something like the Collie, which is uh, fantastic for working with humans, very, very intelligent creatures. All of them came from a wolf ancestor. That's how we get all of these things. Here's modern wolves, here's wolf ancestor. This all happened probably within the last 10 to 20,000 years, maybe even less. It's a very short time frame turned that into the little puffball Pomeranians or Chihuahuas that you see. All these dog breeds came from there. The Chihuahua and the Great Dane are actually the exact same species. They just have clearly been selected for different traits over time. The St. Bernard and the Pug, same species, still related to the ancient wolf, could actually breed with the ancient wolf if it, the wolf would manage to not kill that one. All of them came from the wolf ancestor. We artificially selected for different traits. That's the common ancestor. Now, you can see right here, this is a purebred St. Bernard from 1850. What did the difference in its nose in only 117 years of artificial selection? We've turned that into this in less time than you might think. And it's not that long to get between there. The Bull Terrier, which you've probably seen before. Here's what their stalls looked like in 1931 to 1950 to modern day stalls. That is only 45 years of artificial selection. Only 45 years. That is someone's lifetime. They could say, back in my day, the, part, the Bull Terrier didn't look like that. And they would actually be right and might not even be that old. That's a short time frame. The Newfoundland, over time, its stall has drastically changed. We've been selecting for that almost like large Neanderthal-like forehead. That's only 45 years. Turned that into this. Now, the danger of this is that you're only selecting for a certain trait, and you're ignoring the overall health. This one here, this um, Belgian blue cow that I showed you at the top, that can't give birth naturally. That double muscle essentially has made the back end so big that the birth canal is too small for that, well obviously not a full grown one, but for that to go through. They're just too much muscles. The only way they can give birth is not passing something back through the birth canal there, but through cesarean section. They're too big. So we ignored the animal's overall health in our pursuit of more and more meat. The English Bulldog, another one of those dog breeds there, because we've selected for a very large head, they almost all have to be born via C-section. We've only focused on big head. 
And here you can see a pregnant uh, English Bulldog with that massive skull too big for those puppies to go through. They had to artificially select for that. This right here is the English Bulldog skull in only 45 years. Turned this into that, that massive underbite. Because that's what people wanted, that look there. They wanted that underbite, and they bred for that, and they ignored the rest of the health of it. In only 100 years of dog breeding, it's caused all these differences here. There's no such thing as a healthy bulldog. The bull terrier, you can see what it used to look like versus what it looks like now. They have so many different problems as a result of this intense inbreeding. The Basset Hound, perhaps you're familiar with that one, that one has a lot of problems due to this extra skin. Take a look at this animal as it runs. All that extra skin is even covering it up. But you can see the difference between then versus now. The dachshund, with the little wiener dog there, over time we've selected for skinnier and skinnier ones, that causes a lot of problems. Has the highest risk of any breed for disc disease resulting in paralysis. The boxer, a lot of problems there, shorter face, a lot of breathing, one of the highest cancer rates in dogs. Again, we've only focused on some things and we ignore their overall health. The St. Bernard, everyone thinks is a working dog. They can't. They've got too much skin, too much fur. They would overheat doing actual work, even though they used to, because we've been selecting for some traits, ignoring their overall health. And the problem is, going back to Secretary at the beginning, we've been selecting for faster and faster horses. This has meant thinner and thinner bones, and those bones are breaking, and that causes problems. If you don't want to see a graphic image, look away now. Here you can see an actual leg in the process of breaking, an animal trying to go on it. All right, the image is gone. Horses like that are going to have to be euthanized and put down because we selected for faster horses, and that meant longer, thinner legs, but that has caused problems. Those longer, thinner legs are more brittle and prone to break easier. In nature, this species would not survive anymore. Racehorses couldn't survive out in the wild because they're more likely to break their bones. A slower, stockier, better built horse, even though it's not quite as fast, is going to have a better advantage because it's less likely to have to be euthanized and put down. Thank you.